everybody and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Melissa and I'm a Scientific Training Officer in the training team at Emble EBI and I will also be your host for today's webinar. So in today's webinar we're joined by Faye and Vortec from the Wellcome Sanger Institute and they're going to talk to us um, about worm base and parasite resources. Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, as Melissa said, I'm Faye Rogers and I'm here with my colleague Vortec Bazant. Um, Hello. Uh, and we're going to be introducing the Helminth genome resource worm based parasite. Okay, um, so as I said, we're going to be introducing the Helminth genome resource worm based parasite today. Um, if you are a, a new user to worm based parasite, um, this is the URL of the website we're going to be talking about, parasite.wormbase.org. And if you have any questions that we don't answer today, you can always email us at parasitehelp at sanger.ac.uk. Okay, so this is just a brief outline of what we're going to be covering today. So I'll start with a, a brief introduction of uh, why worm-based parasite exists and um, where we get our data from and what we do with it before we present it um, to our users. Vortex's then going to talk through um, which genomes we have um, and how you can access the data that you're interested in through browsing the website. Um, we'll then talk a bit about our data mining tool, Biomart, which you can use for um, doing bulk queries of data. Um, and finally, we'll have time for uh, any questions at the end. So uh, why a worm-based parasite? Um, I probably don't need to introduce this audience um, what helminths are. Um, they are parasitic worms of the roundworm or flatworm variety. And as you're probably aware, they cause um, huge numbers of diseases of humans, animals, um, and plants. Um, in recent years, um, thanks largely to projects uh, like this one, the 50 Helminth Genomes Project, um, there are increasing amounts of genomic data becoming available uh, to the Helminth community. So worm-based parasite exists to process this data and to present it in a, in a way that is consistent and that's accessible um, so that the Helminth research community can get as much out of it as it possibly can. So I thought it would be useful to start um, just with a brief introduction of where we get our data from and what we do with it before, before the users see it. Um, so our genomes and primary annotation, by which I mean uh, annotation of protein coding genes, um, come from the community. Um, so we're not in the business of annotating uh, protein coding genes ourselves generally. Um, I should mention that if um, the community produces two different genome assemblies um, of the same species, we will take any of them, we'll, we'll take all of them, sorry. Um, and so they'll all go into one based parasite. We don't, we don't choose one uh, genome per species. Um, so once we've got um, that primary data, we then run some analyses across, across all of our genomes. So we do things like uh, predict protein domains um, on the genes that have been annotated. We annotate go terms to those domains. Uh, we annotate repeats. We annotate non-coding RNAs. Um, we align publicly available RNA-seq data. Um, and Boytek will talk a little bit about how you can, um, how you can look at that. Um, and we link uh, our IDs to IDs of external databases like Uniprot. Um, for all of our genomes, we also do some comparative analyses. So we build gene trees um, that incorporate all of the genomes um, for each release, plus a few comparative species, and we predict orthologs and paralogs from those gene trees. Um, so users can then interact with all of that data in a variety of ways. Um, firstly, through browsing the website, so looking at gene pages, at gene pages and species pages, um, and using the genome browser, JBrowse. Um, we also offer a number of tools through the website. So we have a BLAST server, um, and we're going to talk in more detail later about Biomart. And finally, all the data can be um, queried programmatically uh, via the REST API, which we're not going to cover today. But if you have any questions about it, um, as I say, you can always email the help desk. Mm. So I'm going to hand over to Wojtek now, who's going to um, start taking you through the mechanics of how to browse the website. Mm. Um, mm. To Wojtek. So here is our front page on uh, the tools that Faye has talked about uh, the most, uh, the, the things we hope people will use the most are available from here. So there is a link to Blast and to the, to the API and to Biomart. Um, the search box is of course very useful if you know what you're looking for an identifier or so. And if you're just interested in what genomes we have and want to get to a particular one, I always, I always use this link that gets me to this list. Mm. 
So there are currently over 100 nematoda species and over 30 platyhelminthes, partially because nematoda are quite a bit easier to sequence, isn't it? Uh, and, and they also cover quite a few cousins of Cinerobitis elegans. In general, I said some of these genomes are a bit better and some are a bit more draft. A few are assembled into complete chromosomes, uh, whereas other ones are mm, much, less, much, less, much less patchy. So maybe like the human genome was in the 90s or something like that. Uh, there are, are a number of ways to try to see how how good the genome is. So we, we show Sigma and Basco scores as well as the N50. And then on each page for the individual genome, there is a description that says how the genome was made and where from frequently the methods that were used. A short description about the species. So if you have a species of interest, this is, you probably have seen this page already because it's very useful. If you need to do any analysis of all the data that there is all together, here are the download links. So quite a, Quite a common use case is to download the GFF with the annotation, for example, and get the coordinates of all the protein coding genes. Uh, if you are interested in a particular gene, or if you don't yet know what you're looking for, that's quite a bit harder, uh, because it's frequently a research task, right? Like if you have a question that is biological, or you have a sequence of a gene, but not the identifier, then you need to search for it. And a, a number of avenues is open, depends on what, what you have. So for example, if you, have, if you have a sequence, then you can use BLAST to find similar matches. Uh, searching with the text identifiers to try much a gene description is good if you're looking for something very famous. But many of our genomes, they we don't, we don't yet know what they do. I mean, we, the scientific community. So that's also not very easy. Frequently, if your, genome is, if your gene is similar to another famous gene, then it's quite possible that you will be able to get to it with via an orthology relation. So, we have a wealth of data available for each gene. Um, this is uh, a gene page with uh, what happens to be a rather special and famous gene in Schistosoma mansoni, which we will use uh, to, to demonstrate uh, various features that are available. So it's all structured in uh, these menus. Uh, where different sections are available on the left. And then you can go on to the transcript and then protein pages. So it's, mm, yeah, the, so the structure of the page follows what these things are. So from a, a gene, you can go to a transcript and protein pages and so on. Uh, and the information is quite a bit different because sometimes there are multiple proteins for a gene, right? And each of them will have different domains and so on. But um, most of the data is actually on the gene page. Mm -hmm. There is a way to go from here to this region in detail view, which shows the gene model in the context of where it is on the chromosome. And it looks like that. Mm. So there's a number of different tracks that we, that are also provided as data elsewhere. So repetitive elements, different genes that are nearby. You can scroll around this thing and you can search. Um, uh, it's probably not everyone's use case, but you can also attach your own data to this page. So you, you go, here to the add custom tax options and then it leads you on to upload this data and then you can view it in the context of our site. So this is the embedded genome browser uh, and we also have an alternative one from Jane Browse. It looks like that 
And uh, the information on the two is very similar, uh, except this is more like a workbench view. So it takes up your whole screen and you have an ability to select tracks in the separate menu, zoom in and out. Uh, the feature I personally like the most is this search because it searches for all the identifiers possibly there for a gene. And not many people know you can type in a name of something and not just the sequence. So if you find yourself using genome browsers a lot, like one of these could be better than the other one for what you're trying to do. Uh, so let's go back to what else we have for each gene. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of reference material that connects up this page to corresponding pages in, for example, Uniprot, and that's the external references page. Mm -hmm. Of course, like the, the, the model doesn't quite adapt because Uniprot, Uniprot's peptides are, uh, they don't distinguish based on where they are on the genome, but focus more on the molecule. Uh, so, for example, that's why this gene matches quite a few. There is uh, a number of more or less useful sections. That, for example, a literature section, which I admit I have chosen this example so that it has stuff here. And uh, by now you can probably guess what the gene is. It's uh, related to oxamic resistance. Uh, which is a, a drug that was used to combat cystosomiasis, except uh, resistance very rapidly emerged. And it was then found that a mutation in this particular gene uh, stops the drug from working. Mm -hmm. so, so this is the kind of data you can see for one gene. But where Romber's parasite really shines is when different bits of data get connected together. So what is, this gene uh, equivalent to a neighboring species of schistosoma, for example. And Faye will now tell us about comparative genomics data. Okay, um, so yeah, you can also access the comparative genomics data um, using the menu down the left-hand side of the gene page. Um, and I met, as I mentioned earlier, we compute gene trees with every release, um, classifying genes into families. And if you're interested in more details of the method that is used to do that, um, the link at the bottom of this slide is where you ought to go. And you can find that on our help and documentation pages as well, if you're interested. Um, so there are several ways to interact um, with this um, homology information. Um, as I'm showing here, um, we show gene trees. Um, so this is an example of a gene family from Trichurus and Trichinella, um, well, which has expanded in those, in those genera. Um, and just to orientate you to what you're looking at, you can see the, the gene nodes at the end of the branches. Um, and if you look um, at the nodes within the tree, um, you can infer the evolutionary relationship between the genes from the colors of the nodes. Um, so for example, the blue nodes are speciation nodes and the red nodes are duplication nodes. Um, and you can configure these tree, tree, view, uh, these tree views um, to explore the gene families in, in for whatever you're interested in. So for example, um, we can highlight all of the paralogs and expand the tree to just look at the paralogs. Another way to access this data um, is through tables. So that's again through these two uh, links on the left-hand side, orthologs and paralogs. Oops. Um, and then you can see there are some clickable links in this table. So if you wanted to go through and look at the alignments, for example, um, between the orthologs you're interested in, um, then you can, you can do that from these tables. Um, so this kind of way of interacting with the data is useful if you're only interested in one or two genes. Um, if you're interested in a lot more genes, um, then Biomart is probably the way to go. Um, you can also get full gene trees um, programmatically via the API, um, but we're just going to focus on Biomart for today. Um, so what is Biomart? Um, so it's a very powerful tool for accessing data in bulk um, without any programming knowledge. Um, you basically build your queries um, using through these three facets, filters, values, and attributes, where filters are the kind of data that you're basing your query on, values are the actual values of that data, and attributes are the data you want out at the end. So an example of a filter um, might be a genome, the value you would be of 
would be the genome that you're querying, so schistosomonas knife, for example, and you might want out um, protein stable IDs, for instance. Um, so this uh, list on the left shows the main filters um, that you can use. Um, so if you are interested in a specific genomic region of schistosomonas knife, you could filter on that. So you could request just one chromosome or a region of a chromosome. Um, another very common use case um, is to go in with a list of gene IDs. So, for example, if you've done um, a differential expression experiment, got a load of um, candidate genes and just want to find out information about them fast, this is a, a good way in. Um, you might be interested in a particular protein domain um, and you want to query all genes that have got that domain or a goterm would be a similar, um, similar idea. Equally, you might be interested in all genes that have an ortholog in a given species. So these are all kind of ways into to getting data out of Biomart. In terms of the data you want out, the attributes, um, pretty much everything that uh, Voitech covered in kind of the clicking around the website, you can also get out of Biomart. Um, so gene IDs, protein IDs, um, sequences, I put cDNA sequences here, but protein sequences, um, gene sequences. Um, you can get external references, um, so for example, Uniprot IDs, so it's quite handy for converting um, between worm-based parasite IDs and IDs from another resource. Um, you can get out um, attributes of the gene, so for example, um, which protein domains do they have, and things like ortholog names and percentage identity. Um, and you com can combine filters and attributes to get um, more complex queries. Um, so to and make that a bit more concrete, we'll do a walkthrough example now of uh, using Biomart um, to retrieve schistosome and mantini genes from the ZW chromosome that have got an orthologue in S. japonicum and S. hematobium. Um, so what we want to return is the, the list of gene ideas from, from all three of those species. So um, as Wojtek already mentioned, to get to Biomart from the homepage, we have um, a link here in the toolbar. This is what the landing page looks like. Um, and to orientate you, we'll be using uh, this menu down the left-hand side um, to build the query. Um, so we've got the filters and the attributes, and we can see that um, currently the query filters is highlighted. Um, so these are the, the filters that we can use. Um, so we're interested in um, S. mantini genes, so we'll start by um, adding a species filter. So I'll click the species box um, and select Schistosome mantini. Um, so we're not interested in all S. mantini genes, just the ones that are on the ZW chromosome. So we're also going to add a region filter. Um, so there I selected region, um, tick the chromosome scaffold um, box, and here you have to type in the name of the chromosome you're interested in. Um, and you can see as the query is building up that the list of filters that we're applying is um, appearing here on the left. So you can see um, what you've already done. Okay. Um, so we're not interested in all of the genes on the ZW chromosome. We're interested in only those that have got um, orthologs in the two other species, Hematoma and Japonicum. So we'll also add some homology food, uh, filters. Um, so this is a really nice feature to restrict the results to genes that have got orthologs um, in these two species that I've selected. And now they've also popped up on the slide um, as query filters. Um, so just have a, a quick check to see how many S. mantini genes fulfill our criteria. You can use this count button on the top left. Um, and this big number here is the total number of genes that we have in all of worm-based parasite. Um, and the 1,494 um, is the number of S. mantini genes on the ZW chromosome um, that have orthologs in those species. Okay. Um, so now we want to select our output attributes. So you can see that this has been pre-filled um, by two um, output attributes, um, genome project and gene stable ID. So if we have a look at, um, at what we've got initially just by previewing these results by clicking on this results button on the top left. Um, this gives me a table um, with the genome project. That's the same for every row because they're all S. mantini genes and this list of genes. Um, so that's good, but that's not everything we want because we also want the IDs um, from Japonicum and Hematobium. Um, so we go back and add an additional, additional ALPA attribute. Um, so here we're clicking on ALPA attributes and then clicking uh, on the orthologs box. Um, 
and you're presented with a menu with all of the different species that you could get um, orthologs from. Um, so you scroll down to find the species that you're interested in. And here in this example, I'm just selecting the gene stable IDs, but as you can see, there are a whole other load of things that you could ask for. Um, for example, the percentage identity and the homology type. So for example, one to one or one to many. And then we click the results button again in the top left. Um, and this, this is what we are after. So um, we have a table now of the gene stable IDs in S. mansoni, S. hematobium, and S. japonicum. Um, and we can then download the full results table as a TSV file um, by clicking the button up here. Okay, so that's um, just a kind of taster of what Biomark can do. Um, there are some examples of other queries here that you might want to use Biomark to answer. So like I mentioned before, if you've got a list of gene IDs, you can convert them to their identifiers, um, retrieve protein domains, go terms, retrieve their coordinates, generate faster files, um, or equally, you can retrieve lists of genes that have a given protein domain or go term using the orthologs example that we just did or are, are on a certain genomic region. Um, if you want to save yourself even more cutting and pasting, um, if you're an R user, um, there is a Biomart R package, um, which, uh, which Worm-based Parasite Biomart supports, and there's some tips on getting started with that on our help pages. Okay, I think I will now hand back to Wojtek to conclude. Well, so we've talked about these things and uh, there is lots and lots more that the site has to offer and we had no time for. Um, for example, various ways of programmatic access on a number of different kinds of data that we have. So, I wonder if you have any questions about what we have talked about and about the site in general. And if we don't get to your questions, to send us an email. Uh, either me or Faye will answer. Mm. Well, Faye, so I have a question. Uh, <laughs> it's on the next slide. Uh, so I have a some sequences for a set of uh, S. mansoni genes. And I have where it is on the, on the chromosome. And I have the positions, but I need the sequences. So, uh, and how would you advise me to go about that? I would probably advise you to use Biomap, <laughs> unsurprisingly. <laughs> That is, in fact, the most common answer to um, how do I do something tricky with worm-based parasite. Um, uh, then you have also all these more creative approaches. For example, we have uh, worked uh, on making making the, the GFFs more, more useful. So if you're, if you're a Unix user, you can download the GFF and see if the data is there and try to get it from there. If you don't have too many, you can just look up them all through the website. Yeah, like there, there is usually more than one way. Oh, we have a, a question slash request. Is there any way to add nuclear localization sequence prediction to Biomart? We might have to get back to you on that one. I'll see if I can explain it. Uh, and the second question is about uh, completeness statistics. So what are, what are these scores? Uh, okay, so, so Sigma and Basco are based on uh, things that we think should be there in the genome. So uh, nearly universal single copy orthologs. So genes that were that are really common in a, just in one place. And the method is a round of prediction with Augustus on the sequence. And uh, then a check of what, what, which of these genes are indeed there. Uh, a gene that has all of them will have a score of 100, and the 
a genome that has only half will will have progress much less. So an interesting consequence of that is that our scores for Nematoda and Platyhelminthes are different because it's some, some buscos are genuinely missing from Platyhelminthes. And then you also have scores measured uh, measuring the the size of a sequence and how and then how many pieces it is. So uh, the, the 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 actual number of uh, pieces that the genome should be in is the number of chromosomes, right? But it's very very hard to get to assemble a genome into chromosomes. So if you have like 30,000 pieces, you know that like we're quite a far apart. There is also a measure, like so there are also measures of size of the, the size of a sequence that covers at least half the genome, that's M50. And if N50, like the bigger N50 and the closer to size of a typical chromosome, the better. And it's, you can see other values for context and like know what's a better genome, what's a worse genome, thanks to thanks to these. So is N50 a good measure? Uh, so there is a like with every measure, there is a way to to hack it. So in fact, you could paste sequences together to improve N50 and make a scientific paper more impressive or something. And obviously, it doesn't complete a genome. Uh, or make it in any way more useful. So it's quite good to know how it was done. And sometimes this involves like reading the original paper or at, at the very least the, the genome description. So how it was put together, what kind of data. Uh, genomes using PacBio that were created in the last few years are normally more complete because it's a, uh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm on the radio. Uh, well, I think PacBio is a better technology than like the previous short read approaches, but it also has uh, shortfalls. Like it has some systematic error in the assembly. So if you know whether it's PacBio or Illumina, you know what to expect in the sequence. Mm -hmm. There is also a question about Synteny. So can Wormbridge Parasite predict synteny of genes? Can it automatically search for genes next to the gene you are interested in? By next to, do you think it means where they are on the sequence? I presume so. I think we have a, you might have to approach that in a kind of roundabout way. Um, so for example, you can get the um, downstream or upstream sequence, so the actual sequence um, of the gene you're interested in from Biomart. So you can specify XKB downstream of your gene, and then maybe you would need to blast that to find the genes. You could, uh, it, it's more than one step, but you could get coordinates of a gene you're interested in, and then ask for a sequence on, on either side. It can be done through the API, for example, if you need to do it for very many times or you could download the GFF and write like a very small program that will do it. Can we create an output including gene sequences using Biomart? Of yes. course, <laughs> of course. Uh, that is the sequence mart. And it has, so there are two ways of output in Biomart. One is the reference data that I was showing and then there is also the sequence mart and, and the tab, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the query part is the same, and then you go to. So I actually slide. think I have a slide to um, show this. I'll skip through here. Oh yes. So when you're looking for um, output attributes, rather than creating a data table, um, you want to retrieve sequences, and then you have some options of the types of sequence you want to retrieve. Um, so yeah, that's definitely possible. Are there any further questions this afternoon? Okay, so just to wrap up, just a reminder that this is part of our regular Wednesday webinar series, and you can find out more about this series on the EMBL EBI training pages, which are linked from the slides that are shown on your screen. Finally, thank you, Faye and Votek, for presenting the webinar. Uh, once again, thanks for joining us, and hope to see you again in another webinar.